Hi, I'm Jay Feldman, Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides. Great to be with you all and really excited about the opportunity to, to talk about and train on the transitioning from um, current practices and chemical use to organic land management practices. I'm going to run through a quick presentation as sort of an introduction, but the, the real bulk of the program today is focused on actual practical information that will give you an overview and some really specific information on uh, natural organic land management. I wanted to start with um, a discussion of some very influential person, and there have been many over the years, but Rachel Carson, who wrote the book Silent Spring, um, really gives us an orientation to why we're really here today. Um, we are here because we've um, really adopted practices that are harmful in some ways to both people, workers handling uh, chemicals, children playing on turf, playgrounds, landscapes, um, and the environment. You know, uh, we're seeing a decline in bee populations and so forth. So, Rachel Carson brought out this concept that we need to understand the science around the chemicals uh, that we're using and what they're doing to the environment. Um, but we also need to understand biological systems. And this is her quote, you know, um, she basically provided us with guiding principles and affirmation of core values. This is a value-based discussion on some level. Uh, but it's rooted in scientific uh, understanding, which is critical to this. This is a cover, um, whoops, went ahead. cover of the book, the original book, printed uh, back in the 1960s, 1962. And this is her quote, uh, by their very nature, chemical controls are self-defeating, for they have been devised and applied without taking into, com uh, into effect the complex biological systems against which they have been blindly hurled. The chemicals have been pre-tested against only a few individual species, but not against whole living communities. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, think about this, this is, what, 58 years ago. She said at that time, we must make wider use of alternative methods that are now known, and we must devote our ingenuity and resources to developing them. Interestingly, we have a lot of new methods since uh, she wrote about this in 62. So today, um, the, the conversation is going to move from this general presentation, which I'm going to give you, to very specific issues around why we do soil testing, how we condition soil, cultural practices uh, like aeration, and the benefits of these practices in terms of water retention, i.e. less water use. But let me just run down quickly what the rate, you know, sort of the reasons for concern. Um, when we look at a pesticide, and you, you've seen a pesticide product label, when you look at that label, you see on that label the name of the active ingredient. Like for instance, Roundup. You pick up a bottle of Roundup, it says on the label the active ingredient, which is glyphosate. And that is the material that attacks, attacks the target pest. That's the chemical material. But then it's in a formulation. It can be in a liquid, it can be in a granule, it can be in a dust formulation. And all those ingredients and, and mixture of ingredients form the a solution in which the chemical is dispersed into the environment. So in that mixture, uh, we have something called inert ingredients. And often they're, they're, they're described as other ingredients on the product label. The point of this is they end up being the majority of the product formulation. So the glyphosate may be 2%, it could be 40%. The other ingredients of, uh, make up the rest of that formulation. And so why are we concerned about that? Well, first of all, they're not disclosed on the product label. So you as a user and the community, the park, folks, the people using the community, uh, really don't know what all those ingredients are, and some of them are toxic. I mean, they're toxic ingredients. Not all the time, but uh, virtually most of the time, these uh, other ingredients are, are toxic ingredients. 
and sometimes they contain contaminants and impurities and this can be a function of not necessarily what's in the product but what happens to that product when it's exposed to air and water and it breaks down and so we see sometimes dioxin form forming and other hazardous pesticides or chemicals and metabolites. Uh, metabolites are a breakdown product meaning once you oxidize something expose it to oxygen it actually transforms into another chemical which can be as or more dangerous than the what we call the parent compound. And then when we look at well what are the direct impacts on health associated with these chemical exposures we've looked at the 30 most commonly lawn care chemicals and, and these are chemicals that are cancer causing. Uh, they're known endocrine disruptors. The endocrine system is like the message system that control, controls our organs, the, all of our organ systems. They're linked to birth defects, reproductive uh, effects, kidney liver damage, and they can also cause ras rashes and sensitize your skin. In addition to that, I mentioned earlier, there are environmental concerns. And, uh, these chemicals are associated with groundwater uh, contamination, toxic to birds, toxic to fish, and toxic to bees. And that is the challenge. Um, how do you disperse in the environment a known toxic chemical and then not cause indiscriminate poisoning to wildlife and bees? And we saw that problem with these chemicals called uh, neonicotinoids. You may have used imidacloprid uh, for insects in a turf system or a landscape. And you know, these chemicals are what are known as systemic poisons. So they move through the vascular system of the plant and they end up in nectar and pollen and the glutation droplets. And so there's any insect that's coming along to feed on that plant, a flower in particular, um, or a flowering grass, that, that insect is going to be poisoned uh, by that chemical exposure. And so this is what we're seeing in the environment when we study adverse effects. You're seeing these birth defects from a chemical, this was uh, related to atrazine. Um, and so, you know, when we see this in the environment at levels that are considered safe or are in compliance. This wasn't the fault of the applicator per se. This is a chemical that was used in accordance with label directions. We're seeing these, these effects uh, over time. Um, the indirect effects I mentioned related to bees affects butterflies as well. And, you know, if we're spraying a uh, landscaped area, for instance, those chemicals move off the target site. They move through drift, air currents, they volatilize, you know, they're applied, they heat up in the sun, they off-gas, and that moves, that volatility associated with the chemical moves through the landscape and lands on other plants like milkweed. It could land on a habitat um, that, that we have for these insects. So. We're, we're looking at sort of a range of potential and known adverse effects. And then children, of course, you know, we're working in an environment in which children are, are using these, these sites. These are ball fields, these are playing fields, these are parks. And so, you know, it, it's important to understand that children are at elevated risk, right? So children because of their size, but also because they don't have developed organ systems, uh, really are more vulnerable to pesticide expo exposure and the adverse effects. And, you know, studies that are done, uh, epidemiologic studies where the scientists will go out and ask about use patterns, ask about exposure patterns, um, the evidence there demonstrates uh, an association between early life exposure to pesticides and pediatric cancers, cognitive function, and behavioral problems. And this is, this is really of concern because, you know, in many ways these can be subtle effects. If we're talking about behavior or we're talking about autism, um, we're talking about ability to concentrate among children, you know, the studies are very concerning in terms of the link between the exposure overall. 
So we, years ago, I mean, our organization was founded in 1981, and very soon after that and during its development, we have worked very closely with those who have been trying to reduce and then eliminate toxic chemical inputs. So we got very involved with uh, organic uh, practices. I served on the National Organic Standards Board from 2010 to 2015 and reviewed the materials, some of which you'll be talking about today, that are used in organic systems. But the important thing about organic, and you'll be getting much more information on this, is that in organic we're talking about whole systems. We're talking about systems approach. We're not talking about product substitution. Although, of course, we do use products, and we use products that are compatible with organic systems. What does that mean? That means that we don't want to use a product that can hurt a bee or a butterfly, or a bird. We certainly don't want to use products that are harmful to children. So when you're looking at overall the sort of range of issues that we're concerned about, we're concerned about looking at a whole system, how do you manage that ecological system that is a lawn, that is the soil in which the lawn grows, and how do you incorporate materials, products, into that so that you don't work at cross purposes you don't build up soil, protect bees, and then come along and use something that reverses that process and is harmful. And we've worked up a list of compatible materials based on some of the work I did with the National Organic Standards Board, but also the work of the Organic Materials Review Institute, in which they evaluate those materials for compatibility with organic systems. Um, the other thing that was really important to me which we really don't have at this stage in lawn care. So if you go to the store, you've seen that organic label on food, that USDA organic. There's a, a, a rigorous process of record keeping and inspection and certification associated with that label. We don't have that in lawn care per se, but Chip Osborne, um, who you, you've met and will be working with at Osborne Organics, has been very involved with accreditation, that is teaching processes that ensure that the user of materials and the land manager uh, has been trained in organic systems and understands what that's about. Um, so we're learning a lot from agriculture actually when we apply the principles to uh, landscaping. Um, you know, organic agriculture is a 50 billion dollar industry. It's growing, it's, a, it's the largest uh, profit center in agriculture today. So we're, we want to take those principles. Um, they are cost-effective principles. I will be talking a little bit about that as we work through the plan uh, for the properties that um, eventually you'll be working on. This is Chip Osborne's uh, hockey field. Um, and I think it may be softball as well. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. But I showed up on one summer day in Marblehead, Massachusetts, unannounced, Chip, I want to see the field, <laughs> or the fields. And this beautiful field is what he showed me. Uh, it's, it's just something to behold. You know, the, the beauty of this is not just in the aesthetic of it, but it is a system that results in more resiliency. So it's a healthier system. It requires less input because you're cycling nutrients naturally less disease and infestation, and greater water retention. So what more could you ask for? And there it, there it is uh, in Marblehead. So we, when we talk about organic, and this, this relates to organic agriculture, but I wanted you to sort of put this in perspective when we're talking about, especially with those who handle pesticides or make decisions around pesticide use. You, can, you compare conventional, meaning chemical intensive practices, with the organic, and it's, it's incredible the longer these leaves on this uh, figure here, uh, the better the system is. So the soil quality is incredibly better. Okay, what does that mean? That means we've got life in the soil, soil biology, soil biomass, and we're building that up and it's, it's working for us. In agriculture, they call that ecosystem services. They're providing services to both the ecosystem but to also the system, the, the management system. Minimize energy use. We minimize energy use. There's more energy use over here. 
biodiversity. Look at the difference here in biodiversity. And you can go all the way around here. Employment of workers better reduce worker exposure. Look at the difference here. Look at that compared to this. So overall, we're seeing, and, and the same thing, of course, with minimizing pesticide use. Overall, the benefits are just astounding and very exciting because, you know, we're not just talking about a problem. We're not just talking about a problem. We're really now focused on solutions that work. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, we're going to run through what the basics of soil chemistry are, uh, pH, nutrient management, uh, organic matter, cation exchange. These are terms you'll become familiar with. And then we're going to talk a lot about the biomass because the biomass really feeds the microbial activity in the soil. You know, we, we don't think about the environment as the, the land under where we walk, you know, that, that is under us where we walk. We don't think about that as much as we think about wildlife, mammals, birds. We see, we see these creatures in, uh, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. We don't see the organisms, obviously, in the soil, but that's what we need to begin talking about, and we will today. Um, this concept of feeding the soil, an approach to, um, you know, ensuring that the soil microbes are, are, are nurtured, are doing their job. And how do you do that? We'll talk about natural fertilizers and bringing those uh, nutrients. Organic systems do not use synthetic fertilizers. And just one word about that. As a community, whether it's Irvine or any other community in Southern California or throughout the country, we care about issues around climate change, we care about issues around biodiversity, and when you embrace an organic system, yeah, you get all these things we've been talking about, right? You get all the benefits from the health to the ecological environmental benefits, but you also feed into solving these larger, very critical problems. Because with organic practices, we're eliminating fossil fuel-based materials. That's what we're doing. We're taking synthetics out, um, and we're eliminating those. We're using less water, so we're using less resources. So overall, we're having an effect, not only in our community, you know, right here, but we're having an effect in terms of these global problems in terms of correcting these global problems for our children and for the next generation. And, and then there are materials which are really exciting. These are becoming popular and available that go to compost teas. And you've all heard of compost. Well, you can extract the microbial life from those teas and apply that. Um, humates to build the fungal life in the soil and compost to increase organic matter. Now, all of this, determining what's necessary, comes from that soil test that we mentioned earlier. You know, what do we know about what's going on in the soil? And that's critical to making these determinations as to what to use. Sometimes it's a transition period. Sometimes we don't move from, you know, A to Z overnight. We go through a transition because depending on what the soil looks like and the conditions, we have to begin to build soil life, activate microbial activity uh, if it's dormant, build the biomass, um, and build the soil. So we're constantly going through that process uh, and moving to uh, the organic system. Um, Chip will talk about this, but we do not see collapse in any of these transitions. You know, that's a myth from years ago when people said, I'm going to try organic, didn't have the system really in place or the materials to support that, and programs often weren't successful. But, so, you know, keep in mind that we are not only going to ensure that we're not creating a problem for anybody, we're going to improve the aesthetic and improve the quality of the turf system uh, that, that exists. So you can't talk about you know, an organic system without talking about cultural practices. So what do I mean by that? Irrigation, deep watering, cultivation, overseeding, mowing, uh, already mentioned aeration. These are things that will be talked about uh, as part of the organic system. So here we are. Um, you know, you're faced with these 
for some, new ideas. For others, you know, you may be using a lot of these practices already. Might not quite be part of that system that we're talking about, but many of those practices you, that we've mentioned may be in use already, and that's a great thing. Um, I think overall, though, we are saying, you know, there's a discrete list of inputs that are compatible, there are discrete practices that are compatible, and that many of the things we're asking you uh, not to use in an organic system are perfectly legal to use. I mean, they're registered by EPA, they're registered by the state, um, and so some will, will say, well, since they're registered, they must be safe to use. Well, there's where, you know, we, there is sort of a disconnect because the governmental agencies that regulate these chemicals are always playing catch up with the science. So DDT is okay, one minute, a year later, two, two years later, whatever, the science emerges and we find out it's causing eggshell thinning and causing the collapse, collapse of uh, migratory bird populations and eagles, etc. So we, we learn about these chemicals and then we decide after the fact that we want to replace them. We are trying to get ahead of the curve with what we call a precautionary approach. You know, we're taking out chemicals that have controversy around them, there's data in the scientific literature that's problematic, and we're taking precaution. We are saying, look, we don't need these chemicals. Why would we use them if they're not necessary to achieving our community goal, which is a good-looking aesthetic park system, fields that are playable, have good playability, and then you know, the ability to manage these things in a way that um, doesn't, um, you know, harm anybody or the environment. So I leave you with this. Again, just to reiterate, organic landscaping is an ecological management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles and soil biology we talked about. It is based on minimal use of synthetic inputs and synthetic is an interesting word when it comes to the materials that are organic compatible because they're usually ac ac uh, they're, they're extracts from uh, minerals or plant material. Um, so the extraction process is considered a synthetic chemical change process and uh, management systems that clearly restore, uh, maintain and enhance the local ecology. So with that I thank you. Uh, for being a part of this effort. This is an incredible opportunity to learn about organic systems. Um, when we work with communities, we view this day, this training, as the beginning. Um, in other words, the information's there, a plan is created in every community that begins an organic systems approach, that plan is put together, and then the plan gets tweaked over time in response to weather conditions, in response to infestations that may occur, or in response to problems that crop up. So there, there's a curve here of learning, of interaction and consultation. And again, thank you so much for being a part of this really important effort. Go get them.